Yesterday I had the great pleasure of recording an episode of Smashing Acts with Alina, Levent and Jacob. And as we were talking, we started discussing what life is like for us at the moment with the remote learning situation that's going on around the world. And we realised that having a perspective from the UK, from Russia, from Denmark and from Hong Kong actually led to some very interesting conversations. So we went off on a bit of a tangent. And rather than sharing that at the end of the normal Smashing Apps episode, I've decided to cut it out as a mini episode, which I'm going to release today. So this is a remote learning special conversation between myself, Alina, Jacob and Levent, where we discuss what life is like for us at the moment as teachers and educators, and we share some tips for teachers, parents and children who are currently going through this experience, wherever they may be in the world. So we'll dive straight in, where I've just asked Alina the question of what life is like for her at the moment. Uh, well, um, my life has changed greatly for the last two weeks. I have never thought uh, that my life would change like that. Uh, because our schools, all schools in Russia are on distance learning. So pupils don't go to schools, teachers uh, should stay at their homes. And it happened so quickly, so we didn't have a um, decision how to continue learning. And we started to create something, uh, something. So <laughs> it was really something we didn't even know how to uh, solve this problem. And all the teachers were divided into groups, those who are familiar with the tech and know how to um, use Zoom, how to use uh, Skype for online lessons, and those who never used it, some of them even don't have computers at their homes, mm -hmm. and it was a great problem. Uh, so uh, we have like three or four big online schools in Russia, and they decided to take this uh, problem for themselves. And now I'm working with one of them. We have online lessons uh, every day for pupils all over Russia. So I record a lesson from my home and they spread it for pupils in all schools in Russia. And now wow. we have it on TV. So uh, we are like uh, t star teachers <laughs> everywhere. Wow. And I have kids on my Instagram, they send me messages, they say, hello, Lina, I'm learning with you, I'm glad that I found you on Instagram, and we continue talking on Instagram, and it's, for me, it's like a big uh, audience, so I've never thought that I would work uh, for all pupils in Russia, mm -hmm. and, and I'm still in a very... Mm, I'm certain position. I, I'm not <laughs> sure if we are doing it right because they all have different programs. They all have different um, student books, but still, it is something they can learn. They have a schedule. Every day they come at the same time and have lessons, though they have different teachers. But still, it is something that we could do. And now we have like five million. Um, views on our YouTube channel and it's like a big a deal for us. We are all very happy and still not sure that it's really happened to us. <laughs> wow, I have absolutely no idea. That's incredible. So you've got like key teachers, as it were, who are delivering lessons to the Russia almost. That, that's amazing. I wonder how many children your lessons are actually reaching each day. Uh, well, when they watch it online, we have like... Uh, 200 uh, 200,000 views and then they are more and more and more and it's uh, I think that the biggest the top lesson is like uh, 700,000 uh, views. Wow I hope you're doing the right thing uh, I never thought <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of pressure isn't it? It's not just like 30 children you could be ruining their lives, it's 200,000 It is, it is what an absolute honour, though, to be able to do that and to engage on that level. Uh, you know that um, uh, when I first started to record my lessons, the more difficult thing was I don't have um, um, I don't have my pupils. I can't talk to them. I can't see their reaction. I can't react to them. So I talked to my computer, and uh, it was the most difficult part for me. Uh, but yeah, now. Yeah. I got used to it, and I got used to talking to my computer, pretending that it is a pupil. <laughs> so <laughs> it's getting easier and easier. Yeah. 
Wow, that's so. I'm glad they asked that question because I didn't expect that answer at all. That's that's wonderful. That's really great to hear. I just think it's uh, that kind of uh, innovation that we also see right now that uh, that great teachers uh, step up and find new opportunities to to let uh, the learning continue. And mm. I think that shows us also that we will not go back to the school that we left, but that we will, after all of this, uh, come back to a transformed school because mm. we have all learned so much, but also need to reflect on um, the teacher role that we maybe can reach more, many more lots of students by, by mm. using, embracing uh, technology like, like YouTube and so on. Mm. And then that could really transform that some teachers are really to creating fantastic content and others are concentrating on giving feedback. Or I think that will transform a lot. Mm. So, Jacob, in, in a nutshell then, how do you think this is going to change schools when we come back? I know you're not necessarily tied to one school yourself. Hmm. But how do you think this is going to change education, just in a nutshell? I know you've got a lot of thoughts on this. Yeah. I think for one thing that is that a lot of teachers uh, have maybe tried to avoid um, getting too much involved in digital technology. They maybe have a couple mm. of courses and so on. But now they really have had weeks and months where they have to use technology every um, every single day. And I've seen a lot of mm. teachers first being out of their comfort zone, being in this fear zone, and feeling really uncomfortable in that role for the first two weeks. But then they actually start to develop uh, and, and learn a lot. And I think when you have gone out mm. of this fear zone and, and, and are in where you actually are growing with that task, uh, I think we will see some teachers that are much more interested in, in creating progress also in the digital uh, front in, in schools. So mm -hmm. I think that the mind shift uh, set will shift. And I think we see very clearly that some schools uh, have had a clear digital uh, strategy for years and they are much better prepared right now. And we have a lot of schools that aren't prepared at all. Uh, also here in mm -hmm. Denmark, we have a lot of schools that have high-speed internet connections, devices and so on, but they don't have the mindset to. They are really good at using technology in the classroom, but have never thought about how to use te technology without the classroom. Yeah, uh, and I think we will see a mind shift, uh, shift there, and a lot of innovation. Mm. Yes. But for I me, it has that, been yeah. really interesting because I worked actually with a lot of some schools in in Hong Kong when when uh, the COVID nineteen uh, uh, virus started. Uh, so early January, when when uh, mid January, when the school started to close down, I had both for my podcast but also for other projects uh, discussions with with teachers and school leaders there on how to handle this. So I had this discussions also with Danish schools and said, you need to start preparing for this. And it was mm. so hard to convince anyone to listen to that to us because <laughs> they, they couldn't imagine that it would uh, hit us here in Europe or, or in Denmark or in a small yeah. town like this here in Denmark. And suddenly we now are calling from different medias and, 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 and uh, have been on the news and then yeah. and, 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 uh, some local newspapers and so on. That, that actually leads... That leads me on to an event, on to you, if that's okay. Because I think Alina, Jacob and myself, we kind of had, I, I guess, a sense that this could happen, having seen what's happening in China and Hong Kong and having seen schools over there shut down. I think perhaps in the back of our minds, we were perhaps thinking this could happen here. Mm. But you guys, Levent, you you didn't necessarily have that warning time because it, you were kind of the, the very first part of the world where this affected. How, how was that like? Yeah. How did things change? Um, so we heard uh, just as we were going into Chinese New Year, um, and so there was um, Connie Lam. She she announced it. Uh, she announced originally that Chinese New Year would be extended for an additional two weeks. So we were anticipating, you know, just two weeks of just a few kind of assignments online, and uh, and then following that, there was another announcement where it was extended again, and then another announcement that it was extended again, and so. For the the third announcement was that it was going to be extended until April twentieth, and that's tomorrow, right? And then um, a little while after that, uh, we we had been seeing in the news that Carrie Lam uh, was thinking that schools wouldn't go back, and one of the reasons that uh, we had heard was was that there weren't enough uh, masks and uh, and those types of things to to provide students. So that was like the main concern, I think. That that was like the rumor that we were hearing. Mm -hmm because they wanted to provide at least one mask per day per student for the entire country. Um, 
And so that was, uh, and there wasn't enough, there wasn't the quantity available in Hong Kong to be able to, to, uh, to accommodate the country for that. Um, so it seemed like that was the rumor as to why, why schools weren't going back. Anyways, we're two days away from April 20th and we're not going back. And we haven't actually heard any official announcement as to a new date. There hasn't been a, a new official date. But I think everyone's just thinking that it's done for the for this school year. And I think there's a lot of like there's a lot of places around the world who are probably feeling the same thing. Um, so we're going into week 11, I think it is. We just finished our spring break uh, break. I don't know. It's, it's kind of weird. Um, and uh and so I think we're going into week 11 of online learning. And the first first little while, as I mentioned, was just kind of like sending out assignments and uh, doing lots of emails. And um, after after a few weeks, we, as a school, and I think a lot of schools in Hong Kong decided that um, doing more face-to-face -face lessons through Zoom or uh, Hangouts, Google Hangouts, Google Meetups, whatever it's called now, um, that that would be the, the way to, to continue this to make this mm. more sustainable for for uh, the long term and so and i think at least for me i felt as soon as we switched into more face-to-face -face, um more face-to-face -face time with the students i thought that it was significantly better um i think the kids felt the same um i i got feedback feedback from some of the students saying that uh you know they're so lonely and they're so bored at home and like the face-to-face -face classes, at least they could see their teacher, they could see their friends. I don't know, the, I know there are some teachers who don't ask their students to turn on their cameras, um, and, but I do. I make sure my students get their, their, their tech all sorted out and they, they log in just like we're having this conversation now. And it's like, um, it makes it uh, a little bit, at least a little bit more engaging. And uh, it gives me an opportunity to kind of check in with the students um, mm. and so I'm teaching, I'm teaching PE, I'm teaching um, music and film. For my film, it's been fairly, um, it, there hasn't been too much of a change except for when we talk about the projects. Um, it's just through this, through through the face-to-face -face on Zoom or whatever. Um, but like the students are, I, I try to get them to do as much independent work as, as possible. So there hasn't been too much of a, of a difference except for the fact that I don't have the same access to equipment. So I have to, I have to be a little bit more creative in, um, and the, the assignments that I come up with, uh, and I yeah. really have to think about um, what what tech students have access to, uh, and I can't really yeah. assume anything anything more than a laptop, so um, a laptop and a phone. But I mean, a phone nowadays is is often enough for for kids to create a lot of stuff. Um, with my music classes, I, I'm starting to do um, like lessons where I'm I have this top down camera. It's pretty neat, nifty little. Lift up, I hear this, yeah. Uh, nifty little camera where it basically points down at my desk, and I could just, you know, talk about music theory and stuff like that. I could draw notes and whatever else. And um, so the kids will see this as I'm drawing, and um, and then I'll give. So this will be like the theory stuff where we'll talk about theory face to face, and then I'll give assignments where they're actually applying their applying the theoretical stuff, and then actually playing. Uh, for the PE stuff, uh, the, I, I only teach grade one PE at the moment. So for the PE, it's um, I'll make videos uh, saying, okay, kids, this is your assignment for, for today, or this is your task for this week. This is your daily physical activity assignment or whatever. Um, the, the general routine, the weekly routine has been Sundays, make a lot of videos, make a lot of instructions, update my website with all the instructions for the week, for the assignment, all the different things that they have to think about for, for getting, for being successful in that particular assignment. Um, and then Monday, like sending that out to all the students, depending on what, what class it is. Uh, I have a, I have a schedule, a daily schedule for live classes, but then I also have the, the list of assignments that, that students can access. Yeah. So the live classes is where they, they talk to me about their, their home, their, um, their, their assignments that they do without me. And then as well as, um, uh, time to, you know, get a touch base with me about anything they're having problems with. Um, uh, the, it's funny because our, our VPs are, are, are telling us, or our admin are telling us, you know, create this schedule where you're only, um, you're making yourself available between these set hours, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. or whatever it is for your normal work day. But it's really difficult to do that. One of the things that's been a challenge has been you feel like you're on call 24 hours a day. Um, yeah. And one of the things that 
that makes it so difficult is because um, there's a lot of students are, who are completely disengaged, and then there are students who are trying, who are trying mm. so hard. And when they email you at 9 p.m. saying, Mr. Erdogan, uh, like, I, I, I've been trying to do this, I, 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 I'm struggling with this, and I see it pop up on my phone. I have such difficulty, like, ignoring it yeah. just to kind of maintain this, this balance, right? Or to yeah. try to teach the students that I'm not available a after hours. So most of the time, I'll, I'll try to respond because I know the kids are, uh, like, the kids who are emailing me at that time of night, those are the ones who are really trying. So those are the ones who I really yeah. want to make sure I get back to as quickly as possible. Um, another challenge, as I just mentioned, has been there's, there's so many students who aren't engaged at all. Um, for whatever reason, um, they don't have access to tech, they have internet problems. Uh, so it may not even be something that, that, um, that they're doing. Uh, it may just, like we've had feedback that when students left Hong Kong originally for Chinese New Year, they just didn't come back. And um, so many of them went to India and they, they told me, you know, after the fact, after, after being away for, for eight of the last 11 weeks, they told me that they didn't have the internet. So they couldn't do anything. Gosh. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, that's been a challenge. So I've probably had 50% engagement out of out of all the students who have been yeah. uh, out of all of my students. And out of the 50%, you know, some of them are are a small handful are are showing up to all of my my live lessons and doing all of my activities and doing it in a timely fashion. And then the rest are kind of you know getting it in uh, when they can and and it's. And it's kind of hard. You need to think about um, lowering your standards. You can't do the same stuff that you can do in a classroom face to face with your students. You can't yeah. manage. They can't teach in the same way. Uh, and the students can't they can't learn as much from reading a set of instructions that you post on your website or in your Google Classroom or whatever it is. Um, so you can't you have to it's it's the struggle has been lowering your your standards like you want to be able to do so much. You want to move forward. You want this. You want that. But the struggle has been just the kids can't absorb it in the same way as if they're physically with you in the classroom. And that's been probably the hardest part to deal with. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating to hear all three of your perspectives on this. And I, I think I initially asked that as just a short question to finish the episode. But actually, the discussion and what I've just heard from all three of you makes me think that I now need to release this as like a little mini thing now. Um, because I think, this con no, I think this conversation is really valuable. And I think it's, it's amazing to see how teachers around the world are... are doing this in, in approaching it in different ways because we, none of us have had training formally for this situation none of us have really had time to prepare officially for this situation we've just been thrust into it as to have yeah. the children and this is a whole new world and it's scary and it's confusing and there's opportunities and there's barriers but this is something which everyone is is experiencing together and the whole world is coming together right now around this and so I've been looking on the UNESCO website and at the moment, 91% of children are currently out of school and that's nearly 1.6 billion children. And it, I don't think there's ever been a time when that's happened before and fingers crossed it will never happen again, but it really is a, a life-changing moment for everyone. I wanted just to wrap up this little special mini episode, which I've now decided is going to be a thing, um, by asking you all super quickly, I don't take too much more of your time, for one tip for teachers watching this and one tip for pupils watching this about how they can make the most of this situation and, and what they could be doing to look after themselves emotionally, mentally, education, all those sort of things. So a tip for adults and a tip for children. Can I start with you, Jacob? Yeah, um, I think it's really, really important to remember that we are all learners right now, mm -hmm. also us as teachers or school leaders. So really take it in that know that we will all uh, make failures we all need mm -hmm. to experiment uh, make it a part of the process so also accept that the people that you're working together with colleagues and, 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 and your leadership or so on they will from time to time make failures uh, try to embrace that and, and mm -hmm. stay positive and, and also really be aware of how to set up experiments so that we actually really grow as in our profession and and i think it would be really good to some make some kind of diary or keynote slides where you put hmm. down uh, what you have learned, what you have reflected on, uh, how we can make sure that if a similar situation happens, uh, and I think it will uh, yeah. at some point, hopefully not too often, but that we are really prepared, that we are aware of how would we actually 
transform education right now? Because I think also we can see quite clearly now that even if this is hard and we were unprepared, learning continues. Uh, yeah. Kids, they, they are um, wired to learn. And there's a lot of playfulness. I think what we also can learn, learn is that to to keep children healthy uh, and well-being high, uh, I think the the play is really in the homes is a really important key component. And I think that we can also learn that that there can be a lot of learning in that also in school. That we so I hope that we when we go back to the classrooms that we will see a pedagogical focus on challenge-based learning, project-based learning, on playfulness uh, or collaboration. But that we also will see that it doesn't need to be a problem if a family would like to travel to a different place for three months. We should be able now uh, to, to set up a learning environment where some kids actually can explore the world and at the same time still be connected with their friends in their classroom. Uh, so I hope that will be things. For kids, I think... My tip would be actually really to also set some uh, learning goals that maybe are outside of the classroom, but say uh, my oldest son, uh, Adam, he suddenly wants to bake and then started as a math challenge so that he could say, okay, we have this recipe and I would make one and a half times as much. How, how do I then? But he is really uh, suddenly really interested in baking. Um, and my other kid is making all kinds of projects outdoors and outside and so on. But I, have to, I think that we both as parents and as, kid, uh, as, as students really say, this is also an opportunity to take ownership of our own learning and say, mm. okay, I would, I need to learn some math, but I would actually like to create better YouTube videos because I want to be a YouTuber later mm. on. And so let's combine those two things. I yeah. think uh, if you are a student, uh, try to say, uh, I don't just don't need to make everything that my teachers say. I can make it in my own way or I can set my Absolutely. own goals and communicate those goals to my teacher and say, if this should be engaging for me, I will create a project like this. Would you help me with that? I love that idea. I think that creativity and personalized individual learning is, is going to really shine through this experience. It's, yeah, um, hopefully, really yeah. great. Alina, a quick tip for educators and a quick tip for children, if that, if you have. Uh, well, I agree with Jacob. It's very, very true for uh, people all over the world. And I would say that my tip is both for pupils and for teachers. Okay. Just try. Try new ways. Try new mm -hmm. ways of learning. Try new ways of communication. Uh, don't be afraid of making mistakes. And... Um, just try, let it go. I agree that sometimes we uh, try not to focus on what we really like, for example, like baking, yeah? And you mm -hmm. didn't have time for baking. Now you have time, go and yeah. bake and try what you really like, experience that. And you have this uh, emotions, you can experience these emotions. And I would say try to, um, try to understand each other. So people try to understand teachers, teachers try to understand people. So we are both in a very difficult situation, very new situation, and um, it's difficult to organize your life at your home, like you are uh, at work or at school, uh, and it's difficult for all of us and for parents too. And if you are a parent and a teacher, it's <laughs> it's more complicated for you. So um, I would say just try and try new ways. Don't be afraid. I love that. It's a really good piece of advice, definitely. Levent, what advice can you give? One piece of advice for educators and one for children, please. For educators, um, I would say keep it simple. Definitely try to keep it simple. Don't uh, overstrain yourself. One thing that Jacob said is that uh, uh, a lot of a lot of schools that are behind right now are the ones that um, uh, that are that don't have the tech already implemented in the school. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of companies who are offering a lot of different things, mm -hmm. and um, and there's a lot of attraction to all these free trials for things. Yeah. And so um, you may be enticed by some of these free trials, but it may not be the right choice for you. So definitely, I think right. keep it simple. Yeah. Keep Stick it simple you know. is. Yeah, if you already got Google Classroom set up, just stick with Google yeah. Classroom, right? You know what I mean? Um, 
Uh, and then I would say self-care is super important. Um, you know, like I was talking about how, how I feel like I'm on call 24 hours a day. Um, think about ways you can try to stay active. Um, try to, um, you know, have some brain breaks. Um, and also find like creative outlets like think of, of, of things that you could do that that is uh, that's not related to your school stuff um, I, I guess this is both for for students and teachers um, look for things that you could do that that uh, that is exercising your brain and taking your brain away from your obligations as a teacher or as a student that keeps you active and um, uh, and, and you know just uh, gives you a brain break I guess that's that's yeah. the biggest thing yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, my, yeah. my advice to teachers would be, would be to keep it simple, like you said, and not to, to try and reinvent the wheel of every lesson. You know, children across the world and across our countries are doing very similar lessons, and we can be pooling resources and sharing and collaborating on things. We don't all have to do everything from scratch for every single lesson. And I think for children, my advice to them would be, look, if, you, if you're not able to access the learning today, don't worry. At the end of the day, this is something that no one is really prepared for. If you can't do it today, if you don't feel up to doing it, if you'd rather go and be crafty or go into the garden and do some gardening, do that. You know, at the end of the day, you're not in school. We're doing emergency remote teaching. This is not formal online learning. This is emergency remote teaching. And we're all doing the best we can. And we'll all come back together after this. This will end. We'll all come back together and we can pick up where we left off. And we can, if there are gaps in knowledge, we can fill those gaps in. If we've got other issues we need to address, we can do all that when we come together. But right now, I think every one of us, adults and children alike, need to be focusing on ourselves and our own mental health and our mental well-being and acknowledging that actually maybe I can't write that story today. Maybe I'll do it, you know, tomorrow when I feel a bit more like it. Yeah, I think we just need to be kind to ourselves. So, yeah. Can, Honestly, can, I, the, yeah. can I add a tip for parents? Of course, yeah, that's a really good point. Okay, yeah. Tip, oh, yeah, here we go. I just felt an, an inspired by uh, and reminded by your world map in, in the background, uh, Jacob, uh, with all the teachers from around the world that you met uh, last summer and so on. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, and I think this is a great opportunity uh, for kids and learners to connect with a kid from a different country. Um, Especially myself coming from a small country, I think it's so valuable to teach my my uh, kids how big the world is and, and feeling yes. connected with it. Uh, and I think as a parent, try to look into how can we help our kids uh, have a connection, maybe just one kid from a different country that they can uh, FaceTime with or whatever. Mm. Uh, my two kids, uh, Adam here and I, we visit uh, some friends of, of ours, uh, Paul Tollock and his family in Northern England uh, a couple of months ago. So he uh, actually FaceTimes with their kids a couple of times and, and practices his uh, English uh, skills that way, but also just feeling connected and feeling, I think it's so easy right now to feel isolated. We are all mm. at home and the world is difficult to understand right now. And I think it can be so valuable for kids to talk with kids that have, it's in a different part of the world. Maybe they are in Hong Kong like you live in and have been under lockdown for many months already. And, and let, letting kids share those uh, experiences where they can see the similarities uh, in their feelings, but also discover that, uh, that uh, how big the world is and how beautiful it is. And not Absolutely. getting isolated and only focused on the, your own little town, but actually embrace uh, the, the whole world uh, also now. Absolutely. In yeah, and I think and we parents can do a lot to help the kids getting those connections, and we have all some kind of friend or previous connection that we can reactivate that have kids in, in the same age group. Yeah, and and even doing things like this and and hearing from different perspectives from teachers in different countries is a, a really powerful way of actually seeing how how the world is coming together over this and how we're all facing the same challenges and. The children in Cornwall in the UK are facing the same challenges as the children in Hong Kong and Russia and Denmark. And we're all in this together, aren't we? Right. And it makes the world seem a lot smaller. Thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts on remote learning. I think when that conversation started, I realised actually this is something that we need to spend a few more minutes on than perhaps I'd initially thought of. And it's been fascinating and, and really heartwarming and encouraging to hear how all three of you are approaching this and to learn 
from each other in that sense. And I think your tips for teachers, parents and children are, are really valuable. And I hope people watching this will take some of those messages to heart. So thank you all three of you for that. It's much appreciated.